tonight on Nation to Nation. High level politics. The Assembly of First Nations National Chief Perry Bellegarde prepares to meet with chiefs, the Prime Minister and Premiers. We go one on one with the National Chief to talk expectations and measure the Liberal government's performance. And so Prime Minister Trudeau made five commitments. So we want him back again to address the Chiefs of Canada and provide a bit of a report. Where are things at? Pipeline politics. The government of Canada has approved the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Expansion Project. The MP's political panel is back to talk pipelines and the status of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. This is Nation to Nation. I'm Jorge Barrera. It was a big week in Ottawa. The Liberal government announced their approval of the controversial Trans Mountain Pipeline and the end of the Northern Gateway Pipeline. Was this the right choice? And a year in, what has happened to the government's commitment on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action? Our MPs panel is here to tackle these issues. Joining us uh, this week is Parliamentary Secretary for Environment and Climate Change, Jonathan Wilkinson, Conservative MP uh, Kathy McLeod, and NDP MP Romeo Saganash. Thanks for being here. All right, uh, let's start off on the pipeline issue now. The Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain approval. This is the second major project, Site C being the first, where your government based most of the consultation, the bulk of it, was done by the previous government. Yet you came in saying we're going to do things differently, but you know, Kinder Morgan and Site C were all done basically with what the Conservatives had done in consultation. You guys are basically arguing that they did it right. So, what exactly have you done new on this file? Well, no, I mean, we, what we've said is we are going to redo the environmental assessment processes, including those associated with the NEB, and we've launched a panel to actually do that, which we'll report uh, early next year. But we also said that we were, we were going to actually implement some new processes, um, and we were not going to make proponents go back to the beginning, and those included an announcement of the interim principles, which was about additional consultation. It was about measuring the greenhouse gas impacts of these projects so that they could be dealt with in, in the context of Canada's commitment to climate change. And we put those into place. There were additional consultations that were done. There was an additional panel that was put into place with respect to uh, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And through that process, we gathered the information that went to Cabinet as it considered the decision that it would make. Mm -hmm. But, Kathy, I mean, really, though, the, the, the heavy lifting had already been done by your government. Um, you know, the Liberals, though, have attacked you guys for not doing enough, for not doing it right. You see two major projects. Trans Mountain being the latest on, done on the back of the work you guys have done. What do you make of how the Liberals have been attacking and their positioning on this? <laughs> um, well, you know, it, it is interesting because I listened to the Prime Minister and he talked about the one process, the Kinder Morgan being, you know, science base and the National Energy Board process in place. And, and uh, he, he sort of views that as a good rationale for moving forward with that. Whereas in actual fact, the same process that happened with the, uh, the one up north, the Northern Gateway, and, and that was really a political Political decision that he made there but you know the one thing I really want to sort of focus in on because we hear about the objections to these pipelines but what we don't hear nearly as frequently is the Aboriginal partnerships I mean the Northern Gateway had 31 equity partners um, who actually were very very disappointed with the announcement there, there was a big opposition to Northern yeah. Gateway I mean that no project fits, but, 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 there, but there also is and Kinder Morgan, of course, that goes, uh, I mean, I live in Kamloops, my riding is uh, a large area, and I think almost all the sort of land base, the communities uh, from Alberta through really until Burnaby, um, see that there's going to be opportunity, see that there's going to be benefit, and actually prefer to see oil through pipelines as opposed to on the rail, which is what we currently see going along beside the river, which of course is a salmon spawning. So, so I think we need to, um, you know, be careful in terms of saying that there's this massive objection by all communities, because I know that some of the communities uh, in my riding are looking forward to the benefit. Yeah, there's about $300 million worth of mutual benefit agreements. I think that's what uh, Kinder Morgan was talking about that are involved in this. And yeah, a lot of BC First Nations have written letters in support. But, I mean, the, the out point for this, this pipeline is in Slaywe Tooth Nation territory. They're going to see a sevenfold increase to tanker traffic. Now, one of the ministerial uh, panel that uh, Mr. Wilkinson spoke about, you know, when they released a report, it had a list of questions. And one of the questions was, how can the Liberal government square their commitment to UNDRIP with approval of this project because the community that's going to be most impacted is saying no. 
and we're not out of consultant. Is there any squaring that? And, and is Slave Tooth's interest sort of has to be sort of front and center given the biggest impact is there? I think it's an important question. Beyond the environmental aspects, uh, economic aspects, the energy aspects of the project, there's also the legal and constitutional aspects to this, to this project. And those are important. Uh, the Supreme Court has already determined on important matters, we need the full consent of Aboriginal peoples uh, with these kind of projects. And uh, the Supreme Court doesn't define what important matters were, but may I suggest that a pipeline is an important matter. Now, <clears throat> I want to I want to stick with that thread because are we seeing it in the city, especially with Slave Tooth? I mean, because they are going to face the biggest impact. Is this a case where Canada's national and economic interest is going to trump, you know, the UNDRIP when it comes to dealing with Indigenous people in these big projects? I mean, well, the Prime Minister made that case. Let's let's be clear. I mean, as you said yourself, that there is no unanimity on this mm -hmm. issue with First Nations and British Columbia. There are 39, in fact, benefit agreements with with First Nations but, along but the a, along the pipeline. Just just okay. give me a second. Um, my riding is North Vancouver. The Slave Tooth actually are in North Vancouver, and so are the Squamish. And so I spend a lot of time with the Slave Tooth and the Squamish. I met with the Slave Tooth yesterday. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and certainly the concerns that were expressed by those uh, those nations were definitely considered in the context of this decision. There will continue to be work to try to address the concerns that they have going forward. But ultimately, um, you know, there is no unanimity, and and certainly it cannot be the case that every individual nation has a veto. <laughs> well, okay. Well, let's. You wanted to jump in on that, Romeo. Well, I, <coughs> I think. Uh, when I listened uh, during the campaign, the promises that were made to First Nations, a uh, renewed relationship based on respect, uh, starting with the implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. They're not talking about uh, a veto. Uh, there's a difference, there's a distinction that needs to be made between uh, uh, consent and veto. Uh, we have to understand that. It's a legal, technical question, but uh, nevertheless, uh, UNDRIP also contains the right of self-determination of Indigenous peoples. And that's where this whole, this whole uh, discussion needs to, to go as well. Yeah, the Supreme Court has said in various rulings that consent is on a spectrum of consultation. Yep. Kathy, you know, the talk on UNDRIP, and we're going to implement it, we go to the Liberal government, went to New York City, to the, you know, to the UN, and made a big deal about it. And did that create a mis misinterpretation or false perception as to how committed do you think this government was to that, or are they realizing what you realize? You that know, you can't, you can't, it's unworkable in the case. Their, their messaging is incredibly mixed. So they go to the United Nations and make a big um, statement in terms of, you know, implementing unreservedly. And then the language that's come out since, and, uh, you know, from the justice minister, and uh, it's been very confusing. And really, I think they have to be a lot more clear in terms of, having that conversation, what does it mean? Because, you know, I sure don't know. I don't know if my colleagues know. Um, but as I say, the language since that time has been very confusing, I think, um, for First Nations people. Now, we got a couple of minutes left. And, and like, I want to stick with UNDRIP, but UNDRIP was one of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, was one of the central sort of calls to action from the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, given that y your government has also said we're going to accept all of these, you know, there's some, been some criticism that not much headway is being done. Uh, how, do you, how do you respond to those criticisms? Well, I would say that there's actually been a lot of progress on 31 of the 45 uh, areas that actually fall within federal jurisdiction. And actually, if you listen to Chief Belgard last night on Power Play, he actually said exactly that, which is there's been an enormous amount of progress made and we're moving in the right direction. The government is fully committed to the implementation of the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee Commission. We are working actively. We've made a number of enormous commitments, including $2.6 billion for First Nations education, um, an overhaul of the child welfare system, which is underway but is going to be a community-led initiative and we are working through the process, but we remain fully committed to the implementation of the recommendations and we're working actively with Chief Belgard and with communities across the country on that. Kathy, how do you see their, their progress on this? Um, again, I, I think it would be appropriate to say, 
here's the 94, um, here's who's responsible for what, because obviously federal jurisdiction isn't, um, you know, predominant in all of them. Um, you know, what's it mean? Uh, what are the implications? And, you know, to me, that's the first piece of work that you need to do, not the sort of haphazard, well, we, you know, we've done a little bit here and we've done a little bit here. Let's assess the, uh, you know, what are the calls to action? What's the plan around each specific one? Um, and truly, some aren't within jurisdiction. And, you know, I think there's a lot of r excellent calls to action. I mean, to s I don't know that I would have supported all 94. I think there's a couple that perhaps, you know, I think need a, need a broader conversation. Okay. Romeo, what's your take on how they're doing on these calls well, to action? <clears throat> this new government promised real change. I have yet to see the real or the change. Um, in fact, it's more of the same because they've adopted now the same language as with respect to UNDRIP, the UN Declaration on, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I was in a debate two weeks ago in Winnipeg, and Robert Falcon Ouellette now says that, oh, UNDRIP is just an aspirational document. Same language as Mr. Harper used with respect to UNDRIP. So um, I think the two core um, calls to action are 43 and 44. Under the heading reconciliation are 43 and 44. And 43 calls on the government of Canada, the provinces, the territories, and the municipalities to fully adopt and implement the UN Declaration as the basis or framework of reconciliation. They have refused to commit to that so far. Okay, well, that's all the time we have this week. Thank you for so much for pinch hitting. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope we'll see you again, Romeo. Appreciate you coming by. And Kathy, I guess we'll, we'll see you again, too. You betcha. All right, thanks so much. Great, thank, thank you. When we return, one-on-one -on -one with AFN National Chief Perry Bellegarde. What are his priorities going into the meetings next week with Chiefs, the Prime Minister, and Premiers? This is Nation to Nation. I'm Jorge Barrera. Assembly of First Nations National Chief Perry Bellegarde has a big week ahead of him. The AFN is holding its annual chiefs meeting across the Ottawa River in Gatineau. The Liberal government has promised a lot to First Nations, and the National Chief is the key political point of contact on most of these important files. So where do things stand now? Has Canada turned a corner in its relationship with Indigenous peoples? Joining me now is Assembly of First Nations National Chief Perry Bellegarde. Thank you so much for joining us, National Chief. Appreciate it. Now, let's just, let's just jump into the, the big issue this week, which was the uh, approval of the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline. Um, Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould said during the press conference to announce this that the, the requirements for consultation had been met on the project. Do you, do you agree with that statement? Well, again, when you look at the whole, it wasn't only Kinder Morgan, it was also Line 3, mm -hmm. and they, they said no to, to the other one, mm -hmm. you know, and the Northern Gateway. Um, the thing that AFN supports is, is, is rights, and the most important right we have as Indigenous peoples is the right to self-determination, which means the right to say yes and or the right to say no. And so in this case, in terms of duty to consult and accommodate and free prior informed consent, uh, if First Nations along the line or throughout that territory don't feel, there's going to be legal, legal challenges, no question. And uh, that's, that's one of the avenues we have as Indigenous peoples. And, and so the whole, when I look at the process, uh, the regulatory review process, you know, a National Energy Board process, you know, that makes recommendations mm -hmm. uh, to Cabinet, I think the process is flawed, you know, because there's no rights analysis, there's no rights review, there's no treaty and Aboriginal rights or inherent rights analysis and review when mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not part of the National Energy Board's uh, mandate. Mm -hmm. you know, so I think it's not so much the decision that was made, but even how that decision was made. So um, those are my thoughts on the process so far. So if, if the process is flawed, then the decision to approve Trans Mountain, do you consider that decision flawed then if it was a result of a flawed process? Oh yeah, the whole f decision is, is flawed. You know, like For First Nations people, we're on both sides of the coin. Mm -hmm just like the Liberal MPs are, just like Canadians are, you know, always trying to balance the economy and the environment. Mm -hmm. People need to get that. Canadians need to get that. Government needs to get that. Even our own chiefs and leadership people need to get that because we have First Nations chiefs mm -hmm. that do support pipelines. Mm -hmm. We have First Nations chiefs that produce oil and gas. Yeah. They want to get their resource to market, mm -hmm. international markets. So, of course, they're supporting it. And then we also have, on the other hand, people that say no, no, no to pipelines 
And uh, again, we see we have rights, but we have responsibilities to land and water. It's all about finding balance. Mm -hmm. And so from the AFN's perspective, I as National Chief say, we support the right to say in it, yes, mm -hmm. the right to say no, the right to self-determination. And we support those First Nations that feel that they have not met that duty to consult in the common, we support them. Mm -hmm. But we also support those First Nations in, in their drive to get things balanced and you know, their, their resources to market. So it's, yeah. it's really a fine line. Mm -hmm. And I've always said this before, the Assembly of First Nations is not a rights and title holder. Mm -hmm. You know, we're advocates. You know, we're lobby we're, we push for change in terms of policy and legislation. And um, that's what we're going to take forward. And so I'm looking forward to our upcoming Chiefs Assembly, you know, to get direction from the Chiefs and Assembly. So, I mean, we had, we, you know, this Trans Mountain Pipeline and the Site C were two massive projects that have pretty big impact on, you know, certain communities that are affected, West Moberly, and, and we have Slayway Tooth with, mm -hmm. uh, but you're saying, you know, the, the, but they use the same flawed process. So in terms of how this government executed these two projects, you must be really concerned that, you know, these two big, you know, projects with big impacts are still going ahead with this flawed pr process. How, how come, how do you feel about the fact that they just went ahead anyway? Uh, again, it, it our relationship with this this government is uh, depending on what file or what issue you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's both good and bad. Mm -hmm. You know, on some things they've moved. On other things, we need to to start working more closer together to make sure we get to the a proper spot in terms of working collaboratively and cooperatively. So, depending on what issue you're talking about, mm -hmm. it's 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 we can say there have been good marks for the Liberal government. In other instances, it's not as good. Mm -hmm. You know, so the instance of Site C, for example, because mm -hmm. we have a resolution from our Chiefs Assembly to support the Treaty 8 First Nations, mm -hmm. because that's an example of clean energy. It's hydro, it's very clean, but it's going to impact in a negative way on constitutionally protected rights, Aboriginal rights and treaty rights to hunt, fish, trap, and gather. More importantly, though, it's going to desecrate burial sites. And so again, supporting by resolution, the chiefs have said, support the Treaty 8 First Nations. And so that's what we're doing. And so on that instance, no, it's, it's a failing grade, no question. So we're doing all we can to try to support the First Nations to, to slow down and, and have a sober second look at that whole project. Because you may not need to flood 95 acres. It shouldn't have to be so big. Maybe something smaller, you know, where there's less impact on the land and the whole that beautiful valley that's there. But in both these cases, you have the Liberal government basically supporting the conservative, previous Conservative government's efforts on consultation. They're saying, on Site C, you look at the, the court filings in Federal Court of Appeal, they're saying mm -hmm. they, the Conservatives did consult properly on this. So are we actually seeing a difference in approach to the issue of consultation when they're saying, well, the previous government consulted adequately on both these projects? Who makes those determinations on what's adequate consultation? Mm -hmm. Who makes that decision? You know, we've talked about social license, but we've also talked about Indigenous license. You know, so we've got to be involved every step of the way. And as Indigenous peoples, like we're not stakeholders. We're Indigenous peoples mm -hmm. with rights and title to land and territory. So we're, we're not stakeholders. There's a different definition. And I've always said we might be 4.5% of Canada's population, but we're not ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. We're Indigenous peoples. Be and we have the right to self-determination. of will make these points. We have our own land. We have our own laws. We have our own languages. We have our own identifiable people and our own identifiable forms of government. Five elements that, re that are re reflected worldwide, respected worldwide for that inherent right to be recognized. So self-determination is very key. And so in all these decisions and dialogue on energy, on the environment, on the economy, the message is simple. You know, involve indigenous peoples in a very meaningful, substantive way. And you're going to get to that common ground if those, that space is provided for dialogue. Well, there's going to be space for dialogue next week at the AFN Cheese Assembly. Mm -hmm. and you have, you have, you know, you have some, some First Nations in BC, the, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs and First Nations are opposed, uh, the Kinder Morgan. And you have your own regional chief for BC, Shane Godfrinson, whose community supports um, the Kinder Morgan project. So, What's going to like? How are you going to create that space on the ground? You know, at the assembly next week, when you have such diverse diverse positions on such a massive project. Respectful way, respect everybody's opinion, respect everybody's thought. You know, everybody is important. Everybody has a chance to speak. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a chance to voice their, their their opinions. You know, when I ran for national chief, I was asked the question: How do you create unity amongst the assembly of First Nations when there's so much diversity? You know, in a simple way, it's through ceremony. It's the simplest way. There's respect, there's listening, there's engagement, and we're not going to always be united on every issue. It's, it's totally unfair for people to expect the Chiefs of Canada to be united on anything. Mm -hmm. 
Nobody else is united, so why expect us? We have divergent views. Respect that. You know, that's, that's all that has to happen. We have a, a three days coming up. We have a very robust agenda. It's all about respecting inherent rights, Aboriginal rights, and treaty rights, mm -hmm. and pushing the Crown to finally engage with us to respect those rights and move towards processes beyond the Indian Act, close the quality of life between Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples. That's what we're trying to do. So we've created our agenda in such a way that we've got to push this government now, and we have a great opportunity. We have a great relationship, a cooperative relationship, but we need to take advantage of that. It's better than the former Conservative government. When is, like for example, and I use this as an example, we've, we're pushing and, and asking the Prime Minister to come to our Chiefs and Assembly again. When was the last time you had a sitting Prime Minister address the Chiefs of Canada? The only time a sitting Prime Minister addressed was last December. Mm -hmm. And so Prime Minister Trudeau made five commitments. So we want him back again to address the Chiefs of Canada and provide a bit of a report. Where are things at? You know, so last year he made five things. Mm -hmm. Missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. The inquiry started. We said there would be all 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission would be honored and implemented. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to come back to that because there's one key one, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We need to look at ways for honor to be done, including legislation, so we're going to keep pushing on that. But we, we need a process and plan and strategy, collaboratively working together for full implementation because the 94 calls to action is reconciliation, mm -hmm. but it doesn't rest with one department. You need the crown, the entire department is engaged. So that's two. And the National Council for Reconciliation that's and part the Aboriginal Language Commissioner, those things are nowhere on the horizon. Well, not yet. We don't know yet. We still have to keep pushing. So the third thing was a new fiscal relationship with the crown, mm -hmm. moving beyond the 2% funding cap. Is that cap still in place? Because we saw you know, the core well, funding is still... It depends who you talk to, right? Like I said, when was well, the what, last... What do you think? Well, when was the last time you had $8.4 billion spent on indigenous peoples. No, it's a program, but the core... No, 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 8.4 billion, Jorge. When was the last time any government spent that amount on indigenous peoples? The answer is never, never. So, but I'm not doing cartwheels here. But that's not... Because, that's no, 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 let me finish. The 8.4 billion is not flowing out to our communities. Mm -hmm. It's not very, but, Yeah, but, but people got to get that. 8.4 billion is better than Kelowna. Mm -hmm. Everybody was rawing about Kelowna. Well, this is better than Kelowna. So obviously something's happening. So people need to embrace that, but then push to make sure that those resources get out to our communities so they have impact. That's another thing. So changing and moving the machinery of government, right? That's three things. Then he said education. Mm -hmm. Well, that's part of the $8.4 billion. And then the, the big one now, federal law and policy review. So comprehensive claims policies needs overhauling. Specific claims policy needs overhauling. The inherent right to self-government needs overhauling. And the additions to reserve policy needs overhauling because they're all based on termination of rights and title, not recognition. And so we have five key areas. Now I've also added on three more. Languages. Indigenous yeah. language revitalization. The other one, processes to move beyond the Indian Act. And the third one is changing the machinery of government, institution of government. Okay. I guess we'll see next week how far we're going to get in terms of a plan to see this stuff come to fruition. So, but thank you for coming in. We'll, we'll catch up with you again next week, I hope. We'll be right back after this short break. This is Nation to Nation. I'm Jorge Barrera. Next week, we're taking the show across the Ottawa River to the Lac Limi Casino in Gatineau for the AFN meeting. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will be addressing chiefs and is expected to unveil a major announcement on Tuesday. APTN will be live streaming the assembly on our website, so bookmark our page, aptn.ca slash news. That's all the time we have for tonight, but tune into Nation to Nation next Thursday which will be the last day of the AFN Chiefs meeting when we'll be dissecting the week's event. I'm Jorge Barrera. Good night.